Awe and music have always gone hand in hand. From the dawn of human civilization, armies have used music from drumming to bagpipes to full marching bands to raise morale, keep pace on the march, and get troops psyched up for battle. Meanwhile, common soldiers have long maintained a tradition of writing and singing their own music, from tender love ballads to raunchy, satirical, or darkly comedic songs to help them cope with the horrors of war. While often sharing universal themes of patriotism, glory, homesickness, or the soldier's timeless penchant for griping about his superiors, military songs tend to be products of very specific culture, with few achieving popularity outside of their country of origin. During the Second World War, however, one song managed to do the impossible, transcending the conflict and becoming universally beloved by soldiers on both sides of the line. This is the remarkable tale of Lily Marlene. Underneath the lantern by the barrack gate, darling, I remember the way you used to wait. Twas there that you whispered tenderly that you loved me, you'd always be my Lily of the Lamplight, my own Lily Marlene. The soon-to-be immortal lyrics first appeared in 1915 as a three-verse poem composed by Hans Lieb, a Hamburg schoolteacher conscripted into the German Imperial Army. Lieb wrote the piece in Berlin barracks while waiting to be shipped off to the Russian front. To create the eponymous character, Lieb combines the names of a comrade's girlfriend, Lily, with that of a nurse named Marlene, who often passed by the barracks while he was on sentry duty. While Lieb survived the war, the poem lay forgotten in a drawer until 1937 when, after adding a further two verses, he published it as song of a young soldier of the watch in a collection titled A Little Seaside Accordion. The following year, prolific Berlin composer Norbert Schulz set ten of Leap's poems to music, including Song of a Young Soldier of the Watch. His compositions failed to generate much interest, so Schulz distributed copies to a number of his artist friends, including Danish-born cabaret singer Lieslot Wilk, better known by her stage name, Lael Anderson. After performing the song for several months at Berlin's cabaret Gomica on August 2, 1939, Anderson recorded it under the title Song of a Young Century. Unfortunately, the Reich Propaganda Ministry under Dr. Joseph Goebbels was unimpressed with the recording, finding it too delicate and sentimental and preferring patriotic marches. Without promotion by the government, the song was a flop, selling barely 700 copies. The song languished in obscurity until April 1941, when German and Italian forces captured the Yugoslavian capital of Belgrade. On the 18th of April, the German army took over the Radio Belgrade transmitting station and converted it into Soldiers Station Belgrade, the station broadcasts aimed at German troops fighting on all fronts reached as far afield as Norway and Egypt, giving it an audience of nearly six million people. Lacking an adequate music selection, station manager Karl Heinz Reinken dispatched one of his lieutenants to the Reich radio station in Vienna to collect a box of second-hand records, among which was a copy of Song for a Young Century. For lack of other options, Reinken played the song frequently during broadcasts, not anticipating the profound impact the choice would have. The song was an instant hit among German troops, its lyrics about a young soldier longing for his sweetheart striking the perfect chord of homesickness and melancholy. Radio Belgrade was flooded with letters requesting the song, including from no less than the Desert Fox himself, General Erwin Rommel, commander of the German forces in North Africa. The station thus made the song part of its regular rotation, using it to sign off its broadcast at 9.55pm. Surprisingly, the song, by now universally known as Lily Marlene, proved equally popular on the other side of the line, becoming a favorite of British and later American troops fighting in North Africa. Soldiers tuned in religiously at 9.55 every evening to hear the song while, according to legend, the guns fell silent whenever Lily Marlene was on the air. As Werner Hofmeister, a soldier in the German Africa Corps, later recalled, it was on the Tobruk front, the beginning of May 1941. The front lines were very close together. In the evenings, you could move out of your positions little by little to stretch your legs, and then our Wehrmacht radio receiver, the link to home, went into action. The high point at 10 p.m. was the Belgrade radio program. Lael Anderson, accompanied by a Luftwaffe orchestra, singing Vor de Kassen, Vor de Gross and Tor. And when we were sitting around in the evenings, all of us listening in silence, there was a noise of some kind coming suddenly from the other side, about 80 meters away, and a voice calling out, Comrades, louder please. It was the English, and this song had long become popular with them too. In this way, we had a real pause in the fighting. Evening by evening during this time, no shots were fired, and right afterward, it was still quiet. So beloved was the song by British troops that Allied commanders began to worry about its effects on morale, chastising soldiers who sang along with the broadcast in German. But when said soldiers requested an English version instead, the Ministry of Information duly obliged, the lyrics being translated by songwriter Tommy Connor. Connor's version, titled Lily of the Lamplight, was recorded by popular British singers Anne Shelton and Vera Lynn, both versions becoming equally huge hits with Allied troops. Lily Marlene was soon adopted as the official song of the British 8th Army and 6th Armoured Division, while America 
American troops fighting in Italy paired the tune with new lyrics to create the popular marching song, The D-Day Dodgers. Meanwhile, the original Lael Anderson version remained popular as ever, a familiar and reassuring presence that accompanied the Allies as they advanced steadily towards Germany. As Fitzroy McLean, a British commando who fought in North Africa and Yugoslavia, wrote in his 1949 memoir, Eastern Approaches, Sometimes at night, before going to sleep, we would turn on our receiving set and listen to Radio Belgrade. For months now, the flower of the Africa Corps had been languishing behind the barbed wire of Allied prison camps. But still, punctually at 10 o'clock, came Lael Anderson singing their special song with a same unvarying, heart-rending sweetness that we knew so well from the desert. Husky, sensuous, nostalgic, sugar-sweet, her voice seemed to reach out to you as she lingered over the catchy tune, the sickly, sentimental words. Belgrade, the continent of Europe, seemed to be a long way away. I wondered when I would see it again and what it would be like by the time we got there. The German propaganda ministry, however, was less impressed by the song's cross-cultural appeal and what they saw as its portentous and unpatriotic themes. At the same time, Lael Anderson came under the suspicion from the German authorities due to her close relationship with Jewish musician Rolf Lieberman. As a result, Anderson was prohibited from singing in public for nine months, while Lily Marlene was banned from the airwaves. Allied propaganda capitalized on the song's absence, with BBC's German language service asking listeners, Have you noticed that you haven't heard this song in quite some time? Why might that be. Perhaps because Lael Anderson is in a concentration camp. This was followed by German expatriate Lucy Mannheim singing a parody version of the song, whose taunting lyrics translated to, Maybe you'll fall in Russia, maybe in Africa, but wherever you fall, that's how the Fuhrer wants it. And if we should meet again, then let the lantern stand in another Germany. Yours, Lily Marlene. Only after Radio Belgrade received thousands of angry letters from German soldiers fighting on the Eastern Front did the song return once more to the airwaves. Finally recognizing the psychological value of the song's popularity with the Allied forces, in 1942 the propaganda ministry commissioned its own English version with lyrics translated by British traitor Norman Bally Stewart. A fascinating character, by the way, Bally Stewart is worth a video on his own. An officer in the British Indian Army, Bally Stewart was cashiered in 1931 for defiling a graveyard of the northern Afridi tribe. In 1933, he was arrested and court-martialed for selling military secrets to Germany, including the design of a new tank and automatic rifle. Convicted of treason, he was initially held in the Tower of London, the last British citizen to be so imprisoned. Thoroughly disillusioned with the British Empire upon his release in 1937, Bally Stewart immigrated to Czechoslovakia and then to Austria and finally to Germany, where in 1939 he began making English-language propaganda broadcasts for the Reich Broadcasting Corporation's Germany Calling program. Initially broadcasting under the alias Lancer, Bally Stewart, along with a fellow traitor, William Joyce, soon became associated with the moniker Lord Haw Haw due to the exaggerated upper-class accents that both men used during their broadcasts. Bally Stewart was arrested by the invading allies in 1944 and charged with committing an act likely to assist the enemy. He pled guilty and was sentenced to five years imprisonment, after which he moved to Ireland and settled in Dublin, where he died of a heart attack in 1966. Meanwhile, the Morale Operations Branch of the U.S. Office of Strategic Services, or OSS, the precursor to the CIA, by the way, launched Operation Muzak, a series of musical propaganda broadcasts designed to demoralize enemy soldiers. As part of this operation, German expatriate singer and movie star Marlene Dietrich recorded a number of English-language songs, including Lily Marlene. Touring tirelessly as part of the United Service Organization, or USO, Dietrich performed the song hundreds of times for American soldiers in the field. It soon became one of Dietrich's signature songs and a fixture of her post-war cabaret shows, typically introduced with the words, Now here is a song that is very close to my heart. I sang it during the war, I sang it for three long years, all through Africa, Sicily, Italy, to Alaska, Greenland, Iceland, to England, through France, through Belgium, to Germany and Czechoslovakia. The soldiers loved it. Lily Marlene. Yet despite the dozens of versions that emerged during the war, the original Lael Anderson rendition still held a special place in soldiers' hearts. So much so that after the war, Anderson was hired by the Northwest German radio network in Hamburg and booked for countless concert hall appearances so the occupying troops could see the original Lily Marlene that they had only known as a voice. So meteoric was the once obscure recording's rise to fame that by 1946 it had sold over a million copies, earning Lael Anderson an HMV gold record. Of the song's original creator, Hans Leap, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces, is reported to have said, He is the only German living in Germany during the war who has brought joy to the whole world. 
Indeed, unlike many wartime songs whose popularity was tied to a particular zeitgeist, the appeal of Lily Marlene endured far beyond the conflict, with versions charting in the US as late as 1981. The song has been recorded by dozens of artists such as Frank Sinatra, Bing Crosby, Perry Como, and Eric Burden, and has been translated into more than 48 languages, including French, Russian, Italian, Japanese, and Hebrew. Many explanations have been put forward for Lily Marlene's extraordinary cross-cultural appeal, such as its universal themes of love and longing. But as with many cultural phenomena, the reason for the song's success is hard to pin down and is likely the product of a variety of different factors, or as Lael Anderson herself eloquently put it, can the wind explain why it became a storm? Bonus fact. One of the most famous cultural uses of wartime music is the iconic scene in the 1942 film Casablanca, in which a group of German soldiers sing Watch on the Rhine, and they're drowned out by a French cafe patron singing La Marseillaise. However, the Germans' choice of music is unusual for at the time. The official anthem of Germany and the Nazi party was Der Horstwessel Lied, and indeed, this was the original music chosen for the scene. The reason for the change? International copyright law. While at the time the United States was at war with Germany, many neutral countries such as Spain and Portugal still respected German copyright. Thus, in order to retain film distribution rights in these markets, Warner Brothers was forced to swap out the Nazi anthem for Die Wacht am Rhein, which, being written in 1854, was by then in the public domain, proving that even in wartime, copyright law remains a pain in everybody's ass.